Here we go. So very happy to start this uh, last uh, webinar of uh, the season before the summer break and uh, also uh, finishing the, this season with uh, two gorgeous ladies, uh, very well dressed. We were talking about it. We, we love it. Um, and, and with Melanie and Alexandra and talking about exciting topics with uh, strange names, uh, EPR, OSS. So we'll get into all of that. But uh, if uh, for people who know this show, we always start with a fun fact. So Melanie, Alexandra, there's two of you. You will need to be uh, short and sweet and funny. So who goes first with a fun fact? I think let's let's shoot with Alex first. <laughs> Okay, so I really struggle to try and think of a fun fact. I think it always do when it's you. But, and I know any of my team that are watching this will know I'm going to say this, but I have a deathly phobia of peas. I don't know why. Ever since I was a little girl, if anyone would have like the little vegetable near me, I would cry and scream and still to this day, keep peas away from me because I just, I can't. I don't know what it is. They're just awful. So... Peace. Yeah, okay. So we will have to study that further. But thank you, <laughs> Alex, for that. Melanie, what's what's your what's yours? Honestly, I, this is one of the strangest things ever. I don't wear a clock on my hand, and the reason for that uh it stops. Ah, you uh, yeah, okay, you've got yeah. Yeah. Okay. It literally stops. I don't wear a watch or anything like that on my hand. There is no watch at all. Sorry, not a clock, a watch. There's no watch on my okay. hand. Yeah, otherwise it's okay, just stops. So. It stops working, stops working. <laughs> Even if it's uh, filled up with batteries, you can change every day. It will stop working by probably midday. Okay, Fact. that's probably not the best uh, like selling thing for someone in a company you know I make things stop but okay <laughs> I've, I've asked is a company where you, you can you can you can be successful and not like peas you can be successful and and stop watches and that's that's amazing so uh, thank you for that actually that's that's really funny fun facts uh thank you both for that let's jump into uh go on with with joy but maybe go into our topic so both of you are with Avas can you give us really in two seconds what is Avas doing so Avas is an accounting and and indirect tax firm where we support e-commerce sellers to expand into international markets um I think we're very much popular on uh, working with Amazon, but also we do work with other marketplaces that are, that are there, eBay, Walmart, um, and, and other om omni-channels that are available out there. Great. So thank you for that. Great summary. So we've got two topics today, or two key topics. One is EPI and one is OSS. Before we dive into maybe, I know each one of you has got his uh, favorite topic. So can each one of you explain what is the EPI and then what is OSS, for example? So who okay. starts? Okay. Let me start on uh, EPR and then Alex is going to come in on uh on uh, uh, iOSS and OSS. So I am wearing green for the for, for a very good reason today because uh, I represent uh, the environment. I represent the trees and uh, the grass mm -hmm. and uh, you know the plant behind you, Jerome. Uh, so EPR, it is an environmental policy uh, in, in which uh, it's, it's a producer's responsibility for a product in how we it's, 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 it, we have to be responsible of a, con, of, of a product when it goes into market and the product cycle. So what's happened is this policy has been put into e-commerce sellers to be responsible of the product that they are putting into the market. So I would say, for an example, of, uh, of packaging, it means that whosoever that introduces packaging or a packaged uh, product into a country market remains responsible for, for that packaging until its end of use, so until its end of consumer. Hence why that sellers or selling partners have been made to be the ones that are supposed to be responsible for, for EPR and as well as uh, marketplaces. So it is uh, generally a framework, but it leaves us also or companies uh, with, uh, with the, the responsibility of, of, uh, of the product uh, life cycle. And does it, just a first question on that, who's responsible? So you've got, let's say you've got a product, one is importing it, 
Uh, one is uh, uh, selling to someone, one is selling it to the end consumer. Who's in charge of declaring the packaging uh, of that product? Is it the one importing, so the brand, let's say, or is it the middleman selling to the end consumers? So it's the person that is uh, introducing that product into, into the country. So in this case, whereby we talk about e-commerce sellers, it's going to be the e-commerce seller. And it's the, the brand, when it's the brand who's importing and selling directly by himself, he has to declare to each country or to the to Europe the amount of packaging uh, he's he's selling through with his product. Is that the, correct? That's correct. And currently, we've got Sweden, which introduced the uh, uh, chemical tax in 1988, and then we've got uh, uh, Germany and France which they've introduced uh, this year. So uh, France, that was from January, 1st of January, and then Germany introduced it on the 1st of uh, July. But this is, again, this is something that's just not gonna be stopping with these countries. There is more countries that will be introducing chemical tax in the years to come. 2023, we have got uh, uh, Spain and Austria, and uh, UK was supposed to be launching uh, its EPR in 2023, but that's changed to 2024. But at the moment, plastic tax is the one that we need to be concerned about. It's not going to really much concern um, e-commerce sellers because it's going to be concerning uh, manufacturers. But I would say that e-commerce sellers, really, they need to be concerned about it in 2024. And we may okay. actually see more and more countries introducing it throughout the, the process. Um, and I think maybe we, we, we can talk about this and expand further that, you know, we, we shouldn't be looking at this as a tax but we should be looking at it as an environmental contribution because we need to be responsible on how we produce or recycle uh, products or, or, or plastic and uh, packaging. And also noting on the points that 14% of collected and recycled uh, packaging, uh, sorry, it's 14% of recycled and collected packaging uh, uh, glo globally. And a third of that, it goes straight into the environment, uh, which means that it's it's landfilled or it's incinerated, which is uh, a huge amount that is uh, actually not disposed uh, appropriately or recycled. So if I if I put in a nutshell, EPR is um, okay taxation or an in incentive program. Contribution, it's yes, contribution it's, it's a contribution, yes, for people who import. Uh, products and packaging and and if in the case in e-commerce when they're selling themselves will have to pay for it and we could see it as an incentive to try to reduce the amount of packaging on products to pay less because packaging is probably nice to see or convenient to transport but it's bad for the environment is that would you agree with that yeah i would agree with that that's uh it's it it's uh it, it's a contribution that goes towards us being responsible in the products that we put in the market and ensuring that with the products that say the products, if, it's, if, it's, if they are made from non-recyclable materials, they are actually recycled. And, uh, you know, it's a process that is taken, that there's a lot of money that is spent at the moment on recycling products, but there is nobody that is actually there to contribute because government policies and all that, nobody is, uh, nobody has that money. So that's why they've put that responsibilities to sellers that are introducing the products in the country to say, hey, the products that you're gonna be selling, they're gonna have effects on the environment. So we need to make sure that we are responsible of that life cycle of the product. And that money, it goes really, that's why I sort of like I dispel the tax side because you know, it, 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 somebody needs to be paid to recycle that product. And that's where the money goes towards. That's a fair comment. I would agree, Melanie. And just to give, an, before we jump into OSS so that Alex doesn't go to sleep, um, the like what, what type of amount of money are you talking about? Is it like a percentage of the end user price or is it what, what's a, like, just to give a taste to the listeners of what, what are we talking about in terms of amount of money? Uh, to be honest, it's a very minimal amount, but also it just depends on how much product you are selling. So it's how much you are putting into the environment. And because it is a, a contribution, it is uh, calculated on based on how much you have actually put into the environment. So that's going to be the weight and the types of product that you have actually put into the environment. But I, if, you, if you ask me, probably I'll have to forfeit uh, a dinner for 
for, for one month. Uh, if, if I go out every month out for dinner, um, I'll, I'll have to forfeit just one dinner, one meal out with the family to contribute towards the environment. And I think um, as, uh, as humans, we, we sort of like uh, think about the fact that we have done already enough damage to this uh, planet. So we need to recognize that if this is a necessary solution that uh, it, 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 to, to create the secular economy for packaging and uh, also aim for making sure that, you know, it doesn't just, uh, and, and I will say, Jerome, it, it's just not about the contribution. Uh, this, is the, this program is gonna make sellers to be aware of the products that they put in the market, the product that they sell. So which means, yes, it's okay for you to contribute something, but you need to think about probably you need to use more recycled materials now so that uh, the environment is, uh, is, uh, is uh, it becomes a bit uh, a safer place for your children to live in. So th th there's just more than just money that is going somewhere. I, I think we, you really, we, we need to look at the life cycle of the products that you put out. And if, if uh, there's too much packaging that is going on on the product, when it's packaged from uh, say China, probably you need to look at that fact, maybe they they put more recycled uh, materials. Um, the, the, the oceans at the moment, the amount of plastic and paper that goes into the ocean, it, 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 it is quite a, a, a lot. So you, we've got uh, the, the weather at the moment is up and down. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an environmental crisis that uh, we, we are in. So we definitely, I would say it, it's, we need to make sure that we solve the packaging waste pollution crisis that is currently available. Hence why more comprehensive circular economy approach is actually required in order to eliminate the packaging uh, that we, know we don't need, innovate to ensure that the packaging that we need is reusable and also we can, uh, we can recycle that packaging and also circulate all the packaging we use in order to make sure that we're keeping the environment clean. So Melanie can explain you how to declare EPR, but also why EPR is a good thing. So thank you for all of that, Melanie. But let's get into a bit of OSS, which is a totally yeah. different uh, topic, Alex. Can you give us a few, like, what, what is OSS? Yeah, of course. And sorry, I didn't coordinate my outfit with my topic. I do feel like <laughs> Melanie has really shown me up. I have no reference to my dress relating to OSS in any way whatsoever. Um, OSS was launched in July 2021 last year. Um, it came in with a few changes that came through and it was really aimed at helping sellers and helping businesses trade across Europe. There was legislation that was changing that changed the place of supply to the arrival country as opposed to um, the, the departure country, which would have caused sellers to maybe need to register in sort of 26 odd member states. So it was really causing paperwork and, and hassle to sellers and putting them off maybe wanting to sell into Europe. So the tax offices sort of came together and came up with the OSS solution, which allowed you to trade into all the different EU member states um, and declare that into a one a one back return if, if they were distance sales. There is obviously disclaimers and, and things to look at for anyone that is looking to use the OSS scheme. Um, and there's always particular circumstances to so make sure you have a business review before you sort of look at it and think, okay, I can do one back return, that's fantastic. There are obviously always disclaimers and things on it, but it was aimed at one, reducing the VAT gap. A lot of people were confused about declaring VAT, maybe missed declaring VAT, not calculating thresholds correctly, um, overwhelmed with the amount of registrations and things like that. So with coming into place of deemed supplier rules where um, uh, platforms such as Amazon and things become sort of the deemed supplier for sales, they're also brought in the OSS, which reduced the elimination of, sort of as much paperwork for sellers. So it allowed people to trade whilst also trying to help them eliminate as much of paperwork and admin as possible, whilst making it more fair competition uh, with the use of the deemed suppliers. So people now have to declare sales. It's the it's Amazon or the other platforms that are declaring on their behalf. They can't just sort of get away with, with not declaring VAT, which a lot of those that were 
couldn't compete with the, the profit margins, couldn't compete with those sort of areas. So it was a big movement in July 2021. We saw loads of stuff happen and OS was a one sort of large admin burden reduction that was brought in with it. Okay. I have already one question. I I know the answer, but I think it's much easy, much nicer to have it from you. Is that uh, uh, there's a, you were talking about distant selling. So just to be clear for people, when you're talking about Amazon, if you're a seller, you can sell uh, into multiple countries with uh, having your stock in only one country. And the second option is you have what they call Penny U FBA, which is having stock in multiple countries. Can you help us understand, like, is OSS possible in each options? What, what are the sort of intrication or implications for sellers? Of course. So there is two completely different scenarios there. And there's also then two completely different scenarios within them as well. So the first one being um, you've got stock in, in one country, say Italy, then you have to have an Italian VAT number. Wherever you've got stock is where you have to have a VAT number. So you have to declare any sale, for example, going from Italy to Italy in your Italian VAT return. That's not a distant sale, it's a local sale. Thereafter, if you've got goods moving from say Italy to, to Germany, that's a distant sale from one country, from one member state to a different member state. So that could go in your in your OS return. Um, obviously, it is subject to like incorporation, where you're incorporated and things like that, of where you'd be registered for OSS and how the rules apply. With Pan EU, obviously, you will always have the extra burden of VAT registration and compliance because you're allowing um, Amazon in the Pan EU circumstance to have stock in seven countries including the UK um, which then in turn you have to have VAT numbers and be filing where you've got stock you'll still have those seven VAT number requirements um, and then uh, the OSS could go uh, on top of that um, for example but if you're selling on on websites that maybe don't have the pan EU um, OS is a great situation where you could be selling in, in a a, a large amount of countries and just be submitting those in the one bar return if your business meets the requirements. Okay, so basically OSS or OS is uh, good if you are located, in, you have one location and you want any distance selling. If you're going country by country where products are in each country, then OSS or OS is not so relevant anymore because you will have to declare the 18 in each country, correct? Uh, kind of. Um, in, it, it can vary. So, for example, if you've got stock in seven countries, you could still be shipping from Poland to, to Germany. Uh, it, just because it's stored in Poland doesn't mean it's necessarily going to go to a Polish seller. So, OS comes into the equation in a lot of circumstances, not all circumstances. So, it does completely depend on your business model. Are Amazon the deemed, or other websites, the deemed supplier for all of your sales? Therefore, you don't need OS. Or are you... Um, um, EFN, are you PANIU, are you um, selling on multiple marketplaces? So it's a real business structure, deep dive on whether it would be relevant and beneficial to your company to have it. But for those where it is, it's a massive, massive benefit because um, you could see a company have to register in 26 member states yeah. have to sell. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really something you have to look into. And uh, usually you say there's a, a big benefit. So uh, can you quantify uh, or do you have examples of, you know, what kind of benefits is it, you know, in terms of money or, or amount of work? What's the main benefits of, of, of that solution? Of course, I think it's largely money and administration. Um, if you're looking at, let's take a uh, case scenario you you're uh, an Italian registered company you've got stock in Italy but you're shipping completely across the world then if you were shipping completely across the world you would need VAT numbers and you'd need to be filing in any country where you have a good arrive so if you've got one good to go into Denmark for example you need VAT registration and compliance in Denmark so the amount of money that would obviously cause you to have to get VAT registered and file in every single country you send to is a massive amount of money, thousands, tens of thousands of uh, pounds to do that sort of uh, task, as well as then the admin of having to calculate a lot of VAT returns um, and complete the documents for a lot of registrations. Um, if you do the OSH structure, if your business is applicable, you need one OSH number and your Italian uh, incorporation VAT number, for example, and all of those sales um, that are distant sales be put into one 
return uh, compared to a lot, lot, lot more. <laughs> I think you're on mute. <laughs> I am on mute, how, uh, you know, so many years after using Zoom. Um, <laughs> It's like I get the, the benefits like in terms of time and also time in spending of uh, like paying someone maybe to do the return. I've asked, it's great to do that, by the way, but it's you might save a bit of money by not doing it. Now, I have another question. Let's say I'm a seller. I've got I'm using Penny UFBA, so I'm selling mostly from like local selling. So I have VAT numbers in every country. Now, like you said, it can happen that I have stock in France, but sometime at some point there's a situation which is out of stock and Amazon decides to sell directly from Germany, from France to Germany, for example. Let's say uh, in this situation, would you recommend to have an OSS, uh, like uh, open OSS? In this case, where do you open it? You have, you choose one of the countries. What, what's your... So what's the best practice here? So the answer to that question is there's two answers. One, it depends on where you're incorporated. So first thing, if you're a non-EU company, that structure is a lot easier for you. You're a US entity and you're selling only on Amazon Pan EU. Now, Amazon are the deemed supplier for any of your European sales as you're not a European entity. Therefore, if you are making a sale from uh, Poland to Germany, it is actually uh, Amazon or whoever's considered an OMP, wherever you're selling, that are considered the deemed supplier for a distant sale. So all of your sales, you are not the deemed supplier for any distant sales. So you can trade completely fine just having the VAT numbers when you're where you're storing goods because all the distant sales are for Amazon to declare or um, Shopify or whoever you're selling on. Um, so OS wouldn't come into the equation. But if you are an EU seller, you don't benefit from Amazon collecting and remitting your sales in Europe, which is where OS would be really beneficial for you because you've got your stock in sort of seven countries there, all those sales are being fulfilled and you're making a massive amount of distant sales, which aren't considered uh, Amazon as a deemed supplier for Pan EU, which is where OS would be beneficial. Um, so you could have goods from Poland to France, France to Italy, et cetera. So it's the EU entities that would really benefit in this scenario. Um, and then with an EU entity, you have to register for OS in your incorporation country. So if you're um, an Italian company, you have to get registered for Italian OS. So you'd have an Italian VAT number and an Italian OS VAT number. Um, that's sort of how you've always got to think of where you're incorporated and then the business structure that would apply. And one question to what you said is when it's a US or a little, you know, from Japan, wherever, and you're selling in, in Europe, you said that Amazon becomes uh, the deemed suppliers or was it the correct wording? Correct, yes. Yeah. And does that mean that Amazon will pay the VAT in your name to the fiscal uh, authorities? Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so Amazon will collect and remit on your behalf. So if you are Pan EU and you've got stock, for example, in Poland, it's Amazon then that deems supplies the customer. So Amazon are buying the good from you in Poland. So you're making a Polish to Polish sale. And then it's Amazon that then do the Poland to Italy transaction, which is why as they're the deemed supplier. So for example, a European entity would benefit from the same scheme in the UK. Um, they don't benefit in Europe, because that's where they're incorporated, but mm. it's it's that distant sales sector is removed because it's Amazon that make the final transaction. So all of your sales end up being local sales because you sell directly to Amazon in country. But Amazon doesn't buy your product in, in reality, right? Because it's the end consumer who's buying. It. So even though Amazon is not buying the product, mm. they are deemed or they are seen as the one like uh, selling the products and therefore, are liable to pay VAT back to the government, is that correct? Yeah, so Amazon essentially are collecting it as part of the reducing the VAT gap is when the deemed supplier rules were brought into place. So for Europe, it was brought into place from July 2021. For UK, it was brought into place from January 2021 in line with Brexit. So when the when they um, are collecting remitting the VAT, it's essentially stopping maybe sellers not registering for VAT and just putting, or just registering for VAT and putting a zero on their VAT return or whatsoever. Every time you're making a transaction, uh, Amazon as a deemed supplier would recognize the VAT amount due and give that directly to the tax office when the sale was made, as opposed to it being um, the responsibility of the, the seller uh, in their VAT return at the end of the month or the quarter. 
Okay, so that that's that's a big thing, right? If if you're based in Europe or based in outside of Europe, it has a big implication. Like if OSS makes more sense in that in that um, equation when you're based in Europe, actually, than when you're outside of Europe. If you're going multi-country, if it's still one country, OSS is always interesting. Um, that's really interesting. Thank you, Alexander. I've I've learned a lot of things. So I I thought I was an expert. So here you go. I'm not. Um, well, I'm becoming better today. Um, <laughs> one, one thing. So the first of July was a big date, right? And I think that's mostly on the EPR side, right, Milani? It's like it, that was a, a big date. Did did something happen special in the first of July, or or not really? Yeah, so uh, Germany is the one that became uh, live with EPR, which with packaging, um, in particular as a as a category. So the, the, the Germany has got uh, three categories at the moment. So depending on what you are selling, so the packaging, everybody goes through packaging. Um, you know, the marketplace wraps the products on on packaging all the time, um, and also electronic uh, and uh, electronic equipment and batteries. So those are the three categories that became live uh, um, in, in, in Germany, but it was the packaging. That's, that's the one that is uh, everybody needs to be compliant uh, for right now. Whereas uh, in, um, in, in uh, France, the categories they've been introduced since January, but they are continuously just expanding the list. If I'm not, not mistaken, I think we're in about uh, 14, 15 categories that are live right now. So, which is packaging the the batteries, furniture, tires, textiles, chemicals, and then these new packages that are going to be coming in in 20, uh, 2023 and uh, 2024 as well. So the list is higher on France, and I think by probably end of the year, it's going to be coming up 20 uh, categories that France is going to be looking uh, at. Now, Germany, because of the responsibility, I think Alex has talked about a marketplace being responsible or being the deemed supplier, where right now the local authorities, I think there's a lot of pressure on uh, marketplaces to have responsibility on, uh, on uh, how they conduct their business. So the responsibility has been put into the marketplaces to ensure that all the clients that are selling under their platform, they are being compliant. So Germany, we know that that packaging is obviously one of the most important ones. Um, it's, uh, I, I think clients are, are starting to sort of like getting uh, accounts being shut or blocked uh, by e-commerce uh, marketplaces if they do not have this uh, packaging number entered on Amazon uh, Seller Central. So I would turn around and say, if anybody hasn't done that, definitely I'll say do it. If the fact that they haven't actually blocked your account um, you know, it, it, there's thousands of, um, of uh, accounts, especially on Amazon. So just make sure that uh, you are compliant. They will get to you eventually. Um, I, 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 I can promise you that it, it's happening at the moment. We are experiencing people that are coming to us that have got uh, blocked accounts. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is because we, on, on the several accounts we handle, some of them got already in like a warning saying, okay, if you don't get your EPR number by uh, or certification by 1st of July, we might uh, close the account, right? So yeah. you're saying that it's happening in some cases, but as usual with Amazon, it's not very transparent on why some accounts is happening and why yeah. some are not. Yeah, uh, but I, th I think it's because the block, uh, I, I, I don't know how Amazon operates, I can't talk on their behalf, um, but I don't know how they operate internally. But I think if you don't have an EPR number and you currently... Um, is currently selling without any interruption. And this goes to just any marketplace. You need to seriously get uh, a compliant as soon as possible because they're gonna come to the stage whereby they, they come to you um, and get your account uh, blocked. We have experienced accounts that have come to us already blocked. Uh, whether you're using Avask or using any other agency, just make sure that you are compliant. The registration comes through as a as a as one time, and then there is the reporting that needs to be done. Some categories are on a monthly basis, others are on an annual basis. So we can figure out based on what you're actually registered under and what products um, you are you you are selling. Okay, because and that so so that reminds me the same thing with with VAT numbers, right, Alex? Is like when you don't have a VAT number, Amazon sort of closes the account, stops mm. you, uh, disables you to to sell, right? So it's a bit similar in that sense. 
Exactly, it really is. As soon as um, you're recognised to be making transactions that are applicable to a country, they'll expect to see that VAT number on account on any marketplace these days. And the, it all comes down to them being joint and several liable in a lot of cases. If if um, a seller isn't declaring VAT um, or isn't registered for EPR, like Menly said, then they don't want to bear that responsibility of allowing um, traders to trade fraudulently on their website. So that's why it automatically leads to suspensions. And I think quite a lot of the marketplaces are quite good and try to give a lot of time or warning in a majority of situations, yeah. sort of guide them or, or give them those solutions, which I think is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is it is one of those things, unfortunately. And being compliant, it's, it's good for everyone. It allows everyone to trade at a fair even right um it enforces yeah. people to be compliant mm-hmm. it helps like many said put things back into the environment whilst also allowing um sort of you to have effective strategies and not be competing with unrealistic margins yeah yeah i would say that uh, as, as for epr honestly it's uh, it, it's about us just being able to 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 be responsible and because if we move on the current track with the annual volume of plastic that is entering the uh, the, the oceans you know at, at the moment i think uh, we are doing about uh, 11 million tons well that was uh, in 2016 it was uh, 11, 11 yes, so 11 million tons and then if we do not do anything as of like today, now, by 2020, that is estimated to be at least about 29 million. Um, so now 2020, 40, it's gonna be uh, at least 29 million that is going back into the oceans. So which means the, the for the people like us, that like fish, you can forget it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, what you're saying, Melanie, is that actually EPI is, is just the tip of the iceberg in a sense that saying, okay, you're paying on packaging. So the real question is taking a step back and saying, okay, do I need all the packaging I, I'm sort of producing with my product? And I remember working in consumer electronics uh, 20 years ago as like um, having some products and they were produced in China and the, the packaging was so big and the product was yeah. so small, but it looked good on the shelf. So yes. we were doing that. So, and it's completely changing. The good thing is with with the Amazon and with e-commerce in general, you don't have mm. shelves, right? Yeah. You, the shelf is, is, is online. It's a digital shelf. So you yeah. don't need to have a, a good packaging. You need a, mm. a packaging which protects but mm-hmm. the, the idea is how can you do that with, with non-plastic uh, exactly. things and, and not, not having, and having recycl- recyclable uh, elements. So that, yeah. I think that's, that's a key. Now, I yeah. wanted to come to, yeah, go on. Uh, I, I, to go I was, on. Yeah, I was going to say that it's about circulation, the packaging that we use and keeping it in the economy and keeping it out of the environment in order to reduce pollution. I feel like uh, I, I am a climate change activist uh, uh, on this is because I'm, I'm very passionate about the subject because I think for us, it's just not about getting registrations out. It's not about getting uh, clients out. It's about educating the sellers as far as like why you are doing what you are doing. And, and I'm hoping that seriously, this message is gonna be reaching out to people that at the track that we are going, we really, and the volume of plastic that is going back into the oceans, we need to make sure that we reduce that. I would say for me, that's one thing that is far more important. Yes, of course we need to get the registration done because, uh, you know, <laughs> to, to, to get compliance. But at the same time, let's think about the, 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 this, the message to take is that we need to think about our product, product life cycle on what we're producing, what we are putting out into the environment and how it's gonna affect us in the future. I think we, we hear you loud and clear, Melanie, and I think e-commerce is not very green and on the country it's, it's not green at all. And there is an element of, okay, taking this into account and seeing how we can improve that. I think the first step on the brand side is really on the packaging. Now on the marketplaces side will be like on deliveries and that's probably the, the fight or the things, uh, or yeah. I'm mean, very interested in that part also because, you know, do we need a one day delivery? Do we need to have deliveries on a Sunday? Do we need to have like small parcels delivered uh, on, on their own? I think there's a revolution yeah. to be 
uh, have uh, to be had on, on that topic. But let's mm. not go into the environment because that will drive us a bit far. I had another <laughs> question for, for Alex, uh, which is less political uh, and, and more down to us. Um, the, the, the question was for like we've been through one year of one-stop shop and i remember i did an article at the beginning one-stop shop you know the what what was the potential the good things like we've been through one year you've helped a lot of companies uh, you know through that that transition uh, what what would be your biggest learnings after one year like is it a success is it a failure has it been you know has it delivered on its promises? I remembered for me just shortly, the promises was like simplify for, for sellers and also clean a bit the market because you couldn't have like a small sellers coming and trying to be below the threshold and sort of do a bit mm. of dodgy business. Yeah. So <laughs> has it delivered on those promises or um, what, what's your take on that? I think the first thing I'd say is a lot of a lot of times I've been asked that question. I think it's really hard to compare because it's such a different landscape to when it was pre July 2021 because so much changed. It's like you almost can't even compare the two anymore. Mm. But I think there was a lot of myths when it was first launched. Oh, everything will be done on one VAT return. It was sort of sold the dream of you just get one VAT number, you can trade anywhere, mm. no matter mm. what. And I think that was the biggest thing. I was sort of at the time of. Everyone, no, that's not, that's not how it works. Calm down. But mm. I think it's got a lot of benefits. There was a lot of struggles at first. A lot of the tax authorities were still not ready for the release of it. People couldn't get their VAT numbers. People didn't know what to do in the interim. Um, so we learned a lot. I think we're now at a great time where the environment has been understood and the sellers understand the changes that have come in and how that means they can adapt to their business. Mm. I think it is really beneficial from a pan EU yeah. point of view because you've got sellers that can trade. They don't have to worry about having to add new VAT numbers all the time because they've mm. reached a threshold to Belgium, to Austria. And yeah. they can have that piece yeah. of kind of, I've got all I need unless I change my business strategy and unless I add yeah. on platforms, unless I decide to stock in Denmark or something. So it gives sellers a lot of peace of mind. Yeah. About, okay, I'm good as I am. Um, so I think it has been really beneficial, but I think the changes we can't compare it to the past because the place of yeah. supply has changed. Who's, who's um, liable for the sellers to declare the tax office has changed. Um, so we're, we're in a completely yeah. different world, but I think it's done a lot of good. And I think it is making people feel that they're trading on a much fairer ground. Um, yeah. Wherever you're incorporated, your sales are getting declared, people are getting audited, uh, tax offices can see if anything is being underdeclared. It's, it's really opened it up. Um, so I think I think it's been largely beneficial, but yeah. I know it was hard for people to get their head around at first. Yeah, just 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 to chime in on that, to add on what uh, Alex is uh, saying, that it, it, it's fair to say that uh, from a fair trading point of view, everybody is on the same footing right now, and I think uh, probably that the price wars that are there will always be there. Uh, whereby people charge different prices on their products. And it's, it depends on where you bought your product from. Uh, so I would say that, that that is now where everybody is operating. There's no VAT fraud now or anybody that is worried about it. And uh, tax authorities, I would say they did a fantastic job by just making somebody responsible on what to do. Because I think most sellers in, in Europe, they were um, uh, suffering the fact that uh, they were saying that, oh, we're having unfair competition from foreign sellers that are not being compliant. But now everybody is compliant. Um, but also, I think uh, from, a, from a strategy point of view, um, it, it is important to recognize that, yes, the government, they give us the rules that this is what we are supposed to be doing at the same time. Yes, you can have that sort of like a one uh, um, a VAT number um, and store your product in one in one country. You need as a business to look beyond that. Um, we saw a lot of people deregistering um, in other countries whereby they they didn't need. But it's at the same time we we were we were happy to to not to have clients uh, registering in countries um, that they had gone over the threshold. Uh, or that they were going to be going over the threshold for in where we didn't have uh, access to the to that market, um, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the sell, sellers can sell literally in any country. So which means the product, especially from Germany, they were just going literally crazy anywhere in Europe. And because of that, 
we people sellers were passing the distance selling thresholds it, it's helped to sort of like maybe tone that down and slip line and slim line that you can actually do an effective launch strategy today without having to be looking at all uh v all country vat numbers but again you need to take the step forward that okay what is it that i want to achieve where are my clients and it goes back to shipping that we want our products today so which means you're not just going to be only registering in france only if i'm going to be looking to have the product delivered in poland uh today or tomorrow so you might want to look at where are your clients located and have those products available in the country where the most of the majority of your clients are coming from and that then requires you to have the vat number on, the, on of, of that country so that's that dispels the requirement of you now just trading under one vat number i think for me it shocks me even now when i see um uh, people in the industry still advertising that uh, just trade in one, uh, just uh, open one VAT number, everything, all the doors would be open for you. Because I don't think that is a, a realistic message. There is just more than that that is actually required. You don't know the strategy of the seller. Yes, the one VAT number, it opens the doors for you, but that's not the end goal because you're going to be com competing with uh, with uh, Jerome's client who's got who's launched under the pan EU, who's got products available in those countries and also the shipping the shipping charges for them it's going to be cheaper than you who is uh tra transferring products uh one by one in a certain country so they, there is uh, advantages of having one vat number there's disadvantages as well but i will say for new sellers that are looking to launch in europe i would turn around and say yes one vat number in one of the european countries where you're going to be storing your product one for the uk i personally would say that probably launch with uh, three vat numbers just as a start so that you have the product sort of like scattered in the other marketplaces even though amazon in particular will distribute the product for you in the other marketplaces so it's a, it's strategy 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 uh, <laughs> so yeah love that one so thank you very much melanie so i said we would open for q and a's but we went so deep into our discussion that i didn't open the the floor so obviously if anybody's got a question We've got 10 minutes left, more or less. Uh, our experts on EPR and OSS will, on us, uh, we are there to respond. In the meantime, I have a, another question for you, Melanie, and waiting for the question is, um, in EPR, so we know you said that Germany is working, France is working, and the UK should be January uh, 2024. 24, yes, yeah, that's okay. correct. You probably need a prime minister first before an EPR thing. So anyway, <laughs> it's like everything in good order. So like, do you know if there's other countries coming into play or is like if you've registered in the Germany for EPR, will yeah. it work for the other countries? What what do you, what, you uh, look into your crystal ball and tell us what, what's coming up? Yeah, so uh, definitely we've got 2023 whereby we've got Spain and Austria. So those ones are going to be the next ones. Um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised that the pen EU the pen EU seven sort of like follows up very very uh, soon, or they actually introduce something around October to say that they're going to be launching in January. But right now we're clear that we know that we've got Spain coming up and Austria at least in 2023, and then with 2024 we've got the UK that is going to be coming up. So which means that's going to make uh, at least five countries whereby there is uh, activity of uh, e-commerce sellers. Do you expect the seven, like uh, the seven or eight, because uh, more Belgium is coming up also on the Amazon front? Do you think they will all follow up, follow suit? Yeah, That's I, 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 think, I think definitely. I think they, they will follow soon. And if you think about it, and if you look at the legislation and the policies, they, they, we, we are late. We are super, super late because Sweden launched in 1988. Uh, so we've been talking about these things, uh, about EPR for a very long time, but I think uh, th there wasn't it, it, there, there wasn't clear mandate on how it should be Im implemented, who should be responsible exactly, because the, the amount of tax uh, apparently that we pay is not enough to cover the recycling, and that's why the responsibility now has been pushed over to the businesses or to the to to the end, end user that are part of this product cycle 
So that's why we it's it's now and, and, and I would turn around and say there, there is some agencies that have been company campaigning for this for quite a long time. But it's it's good to see that something is being done. Um, and uh, th th think of it when you're going to be um, when you're going to be flying, you are asked to contribute towards uh, uh, the, the environment. So I would turn around and say it, it's it's almost the same thing. This is uh, the same thing. And and for EPR, if you've if you've done it in Germany, let's say if you've you're, you've done the document the, the declaration and so on, will you mm -hmm. need another number for each country? How does that work? Or you need one for all of Europe and you're good? How 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 is yeah. that going to work? So it's uh, each country. Each country it's got its own uh, framework or legislation on how they they do the declaration. So you will need the EPR for each and every. A category that you are selling in and in that specific country um so and europe has not harmonized that because again it uh you know the legislation comes from probably europe first and then it brought down to the national right. level yeah. so yeah so it's it's not harmonized so there's not just going to be one but again i I'm not sure if it's something that they're going to be looking at because you know other countries can turn around and say well we don't have a lot of uh uh uh, pollution or our country recycles more and I'll say Luxembourg is one of those uh, countries that uh, I think is very very green uh, there from uh, from a product it's uh, I, I went in there there's a lot of organic shops there's a lot of uh, everything I was looking at the packaging actually of stuff that I was buying that's how that's how careful I've actually become that I look at the packaging of everything that I'm buying that is this product uh, saying that it's 100% uh, recycled or is it from recycled materials? So yeah, it just, also, it makes you to be responsible, isn't it? Yeah, it's also a smaller country and with a higher average income. So that also helps for, you know, organic packaging and stuff. So yes. it's, it's, it's very much integrated, but I, I, I agree with you. Like it's, uh, we, we need to make uh, customers more mindful. And even if I put my mm. like strategic hat on is like, it's, it's becoming a selling uh, tool or is like a unique selling proposition to say, okay, yeah. my product is, is green or greener. What am I doing? Yes. From yes. And that I think mm. is the best way of, of moving it forward, becoming mm. it, it's becoming a business like uh, uh, opportunity. Um, just to finish it within the, the last minutes, I know you had a few things on like what's coming up. Do you know in, in our ecosystem of, of uh, e-commerce and Amazon, do you, do you feel like in terms of regulations or in terms of new rules or new things coming up? Do you, what are the things people should be aware? I'm, I'm sure you, your crystal ball will, will give us a lot of uh, information. Yeah, so I, I, I would turn around and say we've uh, we've seen the world of uh, um, aggregators uh, come in. Um, it, it's still exciting because there's still aggregators out there that are very busy uh, that we are doing work for, so that hasn't actually stopped. Um, events are back in action and they are all over the place. So I would tell, I would encourage every seller that is out there to attend these events because there is nothing better than meeting with people that are in the industry and discussing things and tips or as so far as like how you can uh, grow uh, your, your, your business. Um, they, they, there is a bit of a hint that's going on uh, that uh, the... The, um, the IOSS might be changed, but that is uh, in early, early stages. I think there is a confusion with uh, more sellers, especially on IOSS, uh, with uh, the 150 euros and 135 pounds on goods uh, when they are being shipped from another country. So I think that legislation, it's going to be refined slightly, not OSS, not OSS as such, but IOSS. Which is what's which is the it, what's the difference between IOSS and OSS? So IOSS is is it's a similar um, principle, um, yeah. but it's just for OSS. It's one EU member state to another EU member state, and then IOS is considered when it's outside of the EU into the EU. So, for mm -hmm. example, if you're doing low distance sales from the US to France, US to Germany, etc., that's when you'd use the import one stop shop. Yeah, that's so that one MFN. Yeah, that's M MFN. So you're importing. So that's IOSS. It's import okay. one stop shop, yes. Okay, great. Any any other things you see coming in, like or uh, things people should be aware of, or you've heard about? 
I think one thing to definitely consider, and it's what I will always talk to of all of my clients about, is the advantages of coming in with shipping. We obviously saw the UK bring in PVA after Brexit. So a lot of people shipping into Europe, having to pay out import VAT, then they would offset it against their VAT due on sales or maybe wait for uh, credits to come through. And it's causing a lot of cash flow issues for sellers selling um, cross border. Um, so from the 1st of January, 2021, we saw um, PVA be introduced in the UK, which eliminated um, so postponed VAT accounting. I saw your expression there, Jerome. I knew I needed to uh, <laughs> break it down. Um, so uh, PVA use, which meant that the import of VAT was no longer a monetary transaction. It was just a paper transaction of here's the import of VAT. You don't pay it out. Uh, France then introduced that um, same scheme um, in the on the 1st of January 2022. Um, so I think we should see a lot of other countries follow suit on that. Mm. At the end of the day, it causes the tax offices more burden. They're having to process loads of credits that they could do without because the sellers are paying it and then they're giving it back. Um, so it's better for sellers' cash flow as well as better for tax office administration. So I'm hoping we'll see a few other countries pick up on the trend and get involved with a similar scheme as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's UK, UK and France. And France. basically that means you don't need to go to a bonded warehouse. You could be in a normal warehouse and not pay the, the AT upfront. Is that correct? Correct. So it just becomes a paper transaction. Uh, you know, the money never exchanges hands. You don't have to wait for all these credits back. Mm. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And I, and I will say on, sh on shipping, um, we... We, we've just uh, launched a pilot program um, with Amazon Transport Service. So I would say that sellers probably, they need to look out on their emails, especially the ones that are, they've got products uh, in Europe or, or already or in the UK. Um, there is uh, a promotion that is going on with Amazon um, where we are the customs agents and uh, you pay, it's, it's a parcel promotion. I'm hoping that, uh, fingers crossed, a, a pilot one is gonna be coming through. Uh, in the common in, in in the coming months, so which means, but, but Jerome, just sort of just to take a bit of a step back, you would be surprised that even on these days, they sellers that cannot sell in Europe or that are finding it difficult to ship into Europe or in in into the UK, um, it's still happening today. My last caller before I actually uh, jumped in was a company in London whereby they stopped their trading when uh, Brexit happened. And um, they're now just restarting again, which is uh, good to see. But, you know, there's still the people that can't sort of like trade. So it would be good for just businesses to just go back and, uh, and, and start trading again and checking your emails and seeing what's available online. I think uh, some people sort of like make, get annoyed that there's too many emails that are coming through via the Amazon inbox. But uh, look at those emails because sometimes they are really, really handy and if they are, you, you might be invited into those promotion. We're also launching, uh, we've got a pilot program at the moment going with uh, UPS, which is almost the same as Amazon Transport uh, Service. Again, again, that's going to be run uh, between uh, Avask Amazon and UPS. So again, I would say people just keep on checking on your inboxes because there's quite a lot of uh, stimulus projects that are there that's uh, sort of like trying to get sellers going again and uh, starting to trade. Yeah. Great. So that's a great uh, ending and, and opening for people who like, uh, it's actually only a consulting gig to know which, you know, which emails you should read and not read from Amazon. It's a, it's a full job, full time job already. <laughs> but some emails are very important. So you, you need to listen to that. Uh, stay tuned on, on those news. There's a, there was a question from Shauna. I'm keeping it as a sort of a closing. It's more, I think it's more of an idea than a question. It's like, is there any award prize campaign to showcase a greener companies and which have duly registered and are paying mm -hmm. and are making efforts. I think that would be a yeah. great thing to develop, to give a, a, like make a marketing effort to like give a prize to companies which are greener and that yeah. which they, they could be able to use. But that's, I will leave us with the thought. Thank you yeah. very much, Melanie. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great evening and we'll see you on the other side of the summer. Thank, Thank you. you. Much, Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank holding you. us, Jerome. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.